to welcome everybody, um, all of you here in person and all of you watching and listening online. I want to welcome all of you to Grace Baptist Church this morning. Like I mentioned earlier, today I'm finishing up this series titled Relentless Grace. And hopefully um, I can wrap up everything that we've talked about for the last five weeks with this message um, that's called Knowing for Sure. And that was really the point of this whole series was that for all of us to be absolutely certain of our salvation, that you're assured this morning that you are saved and that you're on your way to an eternity in heaven, or you know for sure that you're not saved, that you don't have a false faith and a false sense of salvation, and that when you become aware that you're truly lost, that you will immediately cry out to God and become part of his family. And so my deepest desire through this whole series has been that all of you come into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, and I hope this series has helped some of you to do that. I want to start this morning with this slide, which is the slide of a painting um, that was painted by Michelangelo. Anybody know what that painting is titled? Yes. Okay, well, that was a good, good try. <laughs> it's titled The Last Judgment. The Last Judgment. And when Michelangelo painted this picture, he painted the faces of people who were waiting to meet God. That's what he intended to do with this painting. Now, I know it's a little hard to see with the slide, but take a look as best as you can at all of the faces on this picture that he did, this painting. And hopefully you notice that all of the faces are filled with fear and consternation. I don't see a single smile of any face that's on that painting. And so I suppose this morning the question for all of us is if your face were to be painted like these faces on the Last Judgment, knowing that you were going to meet God in, say, an hour from now, what would your face look like? if you knew that that's what was going to happen one hour from now. You know, I've often thought about people who are executed, capital punishment here in the United States, and they know exactly the time that they're about to die, and they always talk about the last meal, you know, here's the things that they had on their last meal that everybody seems to want. I'm not so certain I'd be interested in that last big meal, but let me ask you another question this morning. Is it possible for us to know that all is going to be absolutely well when we meet God? Or do we just have to wait and see? And that's the topic of my message this morning, is I want us to know that all will be well if you're a believer, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ. Now, there's a lot of people who doubt their salvation. They doubt that things are going to go very well when they meet God. And at best, they have this vague hope and they kind of punt the ball to God's mercy and they say, well, you know, I just hope that God's going to be generous and, and that God's going to think about all the good things that I did, but they have no assurance of their salvation. And if you fall into that category today, if you're here in person and you fall in that category or if you're listening online, I want you to know that your doubts are very, very legitimate. Because if you don't have the assurance in your heart that all is going to be well when you meet God, it could well be that the reason is, is because you're not prepared to meet Him. Because those people who punt the ball to God's mercy and hope for the best, I promise you, will be lost on Judgment Day. So if you're in that category today, I want to take your doubts this morning and I want to exploit them a little bit, and I want to magnify your doubts, and I hope that you're awash with doubt because you have a right to doubt about your salvation, and I want to address that. Now, there are some people who perhaps don't doubt, but they should doubt. They're confident that things are going to be okay when they meet God, and they don't realize that they won't be okay. It's something like going down here to the BP or the Shell station and you pull in after the service to fill your car up with gasoline and you walk into the service station with this great deal of confidence that you'll be able to pay and you open up your wallet and discover that your kids or your wife or your husband took those $20 bills out of your wallet that you thought were there. Now, 
you walked into that station with confidence and you thought that everything was going to be okay, but your faith was misplaced. And that, unfortunately, is going to be the experience of many, many people on the Day of Judgment. Remember the first series that I did in this message about misplaced faith, where I talked about that in much more detail than I'm going to today? What I'd like to do for the next couple of minutes is just talk about those of you who are genuinely saved this morning. You're genuinely saved. You know God through Christ. You're confident that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, yet you still have doubts, and I think that's true for a lot of people. Why is it that genuine Christians sometimes still have doubts? Well, let me give you a couple of reasons why that is. First of all, Sometimes we can't remember a particular time or a particular date when you were really saved. Now, I think most Christians can. If we had a microphone and I interviewed every one of you who are saved this morning, most of you would be able to say, well, yeah, it happened on April the 11th or February 10th or whatever day it was, and you'd be able to give us the year when you were converted. But it's not necessary to do that because there's some people who are trusting Christ And they're saved, and they can't remember when they crossed the line, particularly people who were reared in Christian homes. They may not know exactly, but it's possible to know even if you don't know the date and the time of your conversion. But that causes some people who are true Christians to doubt. I don't know the exact day and time when I was saved. I know it happened in February of 2001. I know how it happened, but I don't remember the exact date, but I know generally the time. There's a second reason that Christians doubt, and some of times it's because of the guilt and remorse that we feel over things that happened in our life, and so we're just sort of awash with failure, and and because of the sensitivity of our consciences, sometimes we say, well, I just did some things that Christians should never do, and how could I have done that if I'm a Christian, you know, if I'm truly a Christian? And so people start to doubt because of some things that they've done. There's a guy by the name of William Cowper. I've used him as an example before in some of my messages. But he was a, an English poet and a hymn writer. And he lived in the late 1700s. And he was one of the most popular poets of his time. And he's actually best known for changing the whole direction of 18th century nature poetry because he would write about everyday life. He'd write about um, scenes of the English countryside. And he was actually one of the forerunners of the whole romantic poetry period that took place shortly after the late 1700s. Well, William Cowper was a guy that was institutionalized for a period of time in his life for insanity. And when he was released from that institution, he got involved in an evangelical Christian community, and he wrote some very beautiful Christian hymns and some really beautiful Christian poetry. But all throughout his life, William Cowper suffered these deep bouts with depression, and he was constantly in dread of eternal damnation. He always doubted his salvation. He was so doubtful and so full of guilt that he tried to commit suicide several times in his life. I want you to listen to some words that he wrote um, at one time in his life. Here's, Here's what he said. He said, God works in a mysterious way, his wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps in the sea and rides upon the storm. Blind unbelief is sure to err and scan his work in vain. God is his own interpreter and he will make it plain. That evening that William Cowper wrote those words was one of the times that he tried to commit suicide. He was a neurotic. He was just filled with guilt. And so you say, well, what was wrong with William Cowper? I think, my personal opinion, when you look at the things that he wrote and the things that he said, I think that he's going to be in heaven because there's some very strong evidence that his faith was placed in Christ and nothing else, that it was placed in Christ alone. The problem was his faith was so lacerated. His faith was so destroyed by this overwhelming sense of guilt. And you say, well, Davy had psychological problems. And I would say he didn't have psychological problems. I think William Cowper had theological problems. He couldn't grasp 
the wonder of God's grace. He couldn't grasp the wonder of the miracle that God had performed in his life. And that's true for so many Christians today. They doubt because of guilt, because of things that have happened in their lives. Sometimes Christians doubt because of wrong teaching. Many people have been raised in Catholic churches and Catholic homes, Lutheran churches and Lutheran homes or other religions, and you grow up learning things that, you ne- that never ever give you the assurance of knowing Jesus in a very personal way and knowing that your salvation can be assured. Most of you have heard my testimony, and so you guys know that I was brought up in a home where we were taught that it was possible to lose your salvation. And so all through my life, there was always this instability and always that sense of uncertainty that accompanied me until later on in life, after I started attending church here at Grace, and like I mentioned, when I was finally saved in February of 2001, and became more firm in my understanding of the Word of God, particularly when it comes to assurance of salvation. But I've struggled with that my whole life because of the way that I was raised. By the way, those of you who were brought up in a Catholic home, you know that the Catholic Church has traditionally said that assurance of salvation cannot be had. The Council of Trent, 1546, they said, and this is a quote, let those who believe that, no, that one can be assured of eternal salvation be accursed. End of quote. And if you're taught that way, which is what the Catholic Church teaches, that is a hard hump to get over because you're raised that way. You're raised believing that. Another reason that Christians doubt is because we backslide. We do things that are against what you know, we're supposed to do when we read God's Word. And when we're backslidden, sometimes we think that God has abandoned us. And and He's not um, still with you, you feel like, if you're a genuine Christian. So you have this sense of failure, and it's easy to begin to think that you're not really saved when you've gotten off the path that God's laid out for your life. And then there are some people who are just chronic doubters. You know, if you were applying for a job and they were to ask you, what do you do? You'd say, well, I, I doubt. I doubt that's my main occupation in life. That's my great strength. That's probably my spiritual gift is that I go around and I doubt. That's where I find my groove at or however you want to talk about it. That's what people do. And usually doubt is associated with worry. They go to bed at night thinking that maybe tomorrow morning when they wake up that two plus two is not going to equal four the next day. And so they get very introspective about things and they're just full of doubts. And some of those doubts are legitimate. And some of the time, they're illegitimate. But sometimes Christians doubt their salvation just because that's what they do. They're just chronic doubters. So so what's the bottom line out of all of those things that I just said? Well, the bottom line is I want you to take a very good look at your doubts today. I want you to take them and just get them right out in the open, and let's take a look at them. And I want you to own your doubts this morning. I don't want you to brush them aside. It's okay to doubt because there's a saying that says, he who has never really doubted has never really believed. And so I invite you today to bring your doubts and let's just talk about them. Now, what I want to do before I talk about assurance and before I talk about true faith is I want to talk just one more time about false faith because I think this is so important because I'm still thinking that there's some people, maybe some of you here today, maybe some of you listening online today, that you aren't doubting enough because you're not saved this morning and you have some false confidence. So what I want to do is I'm just going to rattle your cage just a little bit this morning because I want you to think about this false confidence that you have. So first of all, what is a false faith? False faith is based on a change of mind, a change of mind. It's not based on a change of heart. You've heard people say the difference between being saved and unsaved is the 18 inches from your head to your heart. Well, a false faith is always based on a change of mind. For example, let's look at Judas in Scripture. Judas betrayed Christ. He followed him for three years, and then he betrayed him. He got his silver, and then when he saw that Jesus was condemned, he thought that Jesus would escape somehow. But when he saw that Jesus was condemned, the Bible said he took the money and he threw it down in the sanctuary, and it says that he repented. And then he did what 30,000 Americans do every year 
was he went out and he committed suicide. His repentance, folks, his repentance did not bring about salvation. His repentance was just a change of mind. He felt sorry about the things that he had done, but it did not change his relationship with God. And it's okay to feel sorry, but feeling sorry does not change your relationship with God, even if you decide, next time I'm going to do better. And then when you mess up again and you say, the next time I'm going to do better, that does not change your relationship with God. That is not the faith that leads to salvation. So there is a kind of faith that brings about a change of mind, but not a change of heart. Secondly, false faith is a misdirected faith. I gave an illustration a moment ago about somebody going into a service station thinking that they had the money to pay. And there are people today who think that surely, just absolutely, God is going to accept me because I participate in the sacraments. Catholic people, upbringing in Catholics, I'm talking to you. Or you think, you know, because of the good things that I do, they say, surely God is going to accept me because I have been good. And remember, in this series, we commented on that kind of a faith. It's misdirected faith. And then I want to speak to those of us here today, Protestants, evangelical Christians, uh, people that we would consider ourselves to be evangelical to the core. Some of you brought up in Christian homes or those of you that have been brought up in modern day evangelicalism. There's such a thing as a decisional faith that does not bring about salvation. People make decisions for Christ, and they are not saved after they've made those decisions. They may pray a prayer, but they don't realize that a prayer has never saved anybody. Never has, and it never will. And yet, if you're brought up in a Christian home, your parents may actually say to you, well, you know, at the age of four, you prayed a prayer to accept Jesus, and you're saved. And so, I'll tell you again, I said this once before, Christian parents, be very, very careful because if your kids start to doubt their salvation, let them doubt. Let them doubt. Don't you dare tell them that they've been saved because you don't have the right to do that. God will tell them when they're properly instructed and when they realize and when they come to that point, they will know that they have been saved. So the point is that there are those people who make decisions, and there are those in particular parts of our country today that think that coming forward as part of an altar call is somehow inexplicably intertwined with getting saved. And so they come forward in a meeting, and they say, well, I made my profession, or I made my decision, and it may be genuine, but it may not be. But they say, I can tell you when I went forward. That is a decisional faith. So, if you'll get your Bibles out this morning, turn with me to the book of Matthew, chapter 15, like I mentioned earlier, and we're going to start at verse 13. Matthew chapter 15, verse 13. Okay, Matthew 15, verse 13. In in this passage of Scripture, Jesus makes a pretty astounding statement. Here's what He says. He says, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted shall be rooted up. Let me read it again. Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted shall be rooted up. Now think about that for just a moment. Think about all of the superficial decisions, all of the well-meaning decisions. Jesus said that he who has never been planted by God shall be uprooted. That's Jesus' words, folks, not mine. There's a story of an event that happened many years ago in a small town where there were some people who went around the town and they sold evergreens. And they went door to door and they got the whole city block in one area of this town to agree that they were going to chip in together and get some evergreens. And so they did and then the company came and they planted the evergreens, they collected their money, they planted them and the people watered them and watered them and all that these evergreens did was turn brown and die. And they couldn't understand it. And then finally, one of the people went out and picked one of them up, and they discovered that what the people who had sold them the evergreens had done was simply taken branches and shoved them down in the ground. No root whatsoever 
on those evergreens. Have you ever wondered, folks, why it is that there are people who make a decision to follow Christ? They've said, you know, I've decided to follow Jesus, or I've prayed this prayer. And then you look at their lives, and you see absolutely no evidence of that. And their leaves are withering, just like those evergreens in the story that I talked about. There's no root. And you say, well, what happened? I'll tell you what happened. Jesus said, every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be rooted up. So think about that. All of you who have taught Sunday school here at Grace Baptist for many years, think about it, you folks that are deacons and ushers and choir members and other people that have been involved in the church over the years, those of you listening that may be involved in a church somewhere. If you have not been planted by God in the end, your faith is going to be shown to be false. And that's what Jesus tells us. So the question is, how can I know? How can I know what saving faith is? And so like I said, we're going to look at a couple other passages of Scripture. So take your Bibles and turn over to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. This is the hall of faith, right? This is what this chapter is. And it starts out with a definition of faith. In Hebrews chapter 11, doesn't specifically give us the content, but it gives us a definition of faith. And I want you to notice what it says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Hebrews 11, verse 1. It says, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Now, if you have a King James Version of the Bible, or if you have a New King James Version of the Bible, you know that it says that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. That word that's translated substance or assurance is a Greek word that's called hypostasis. Hypostasis. And, and the reason that I mention that is because the King James Version translated it as substance, and it can be translated as substance, but it's interesting to know how the author of the book of Hebrews used that word someplace else in their book. So flip over to chapter 3 and look at verse 14. That same word in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 14, is translated as confidence. It says that we should hold fast our confidence to the end. And that's why a lot of translations, including the New American Translation, translates that as assurance. It says faith is the assurance. It's something we should be confident in. It's the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. So what is faith? Well, faith is conviction. It's the persuasion of something. You're persuaded or you're convinced when you believe in something. And you can talk about that in anything in your life. If you have the conviction or the assurance of something, you have faith in whatever that is. And so that's the definition of faith according to Scripture. But I told you that this text doesn't tell us the contents of what we should believe in because it goes on and it talks about all the heroes of the faith. So in order to understand what we should believe, what this verse is telling us we should have faith in, Turn clear back in the back of your New Testament to 1 John. Remember we got 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John and Jude right before Revelation. So turn to 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5. And here's what it says in 1 John chapter 5 verse 10. It says, The one who believes in the Son of God has the witness in himself. And the one who does not believe has made him a liar. Because he has not believed in the witness that God has borne concerning his son. And you say, well, what does that mean, the witness within himself? Well, the Bible answers that question. One of the things I love about the Bible, look at the very next verse in verse 11. It says, the witness is this, that God has given us eternal life and his life is in his son. And he who has the son has life. And he who does not have the Son does not have life. That's pretty straightforward, right? I mean, the witness is the persuasion. It's this conviction that if you have Christ, you have, just like we said in our songs today, you have everything that you need 
for your salvation. We can fill out the details from a whole lot of other passages in Scripture. The Bible tells us that God laid upon Christ all of our iniquities, all of our sins, all of our transgressions. The Bible says, as many as received Him, to those He gives the authority to become the Son of God. He also says, I've come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. And the text that we've talked about in previous messages says that salvation is a a free gift of God. So let's put it all together and let's talk about what saving faith is. And I want to be very clear about this this morning. Here's what saving faith is. Saving faith is this deep, settled conviction that what Jesus Christ did on the cross for us is all that we need to stand in the presence of a holy God. Let me say it again because it's long. I want to give you time to write it down. Saving faith is the deep, settled conviction that what Jesus Christ did on the cross, when He shed His blood for us on the cross, that is all that we need, 100%, totally, absolutely, all that we need in order to stand in the presence of a holy God. That's what saving faith is. Now, if you're here today, and you, or you're listening today, and you say, well, Dave, I don't think I can be a Christian because I can't live the life. Listen, you've still misunderstood what I've been talking about for six weeks now, if that's what you say. You still don't understand, and I'm glad that you're here today, and I'm glad that you're listening if you still don't understand, because if you say, I don't know that I can live that life, you're still thinking that somehow salvation is a cooperative effort between you and God where God does His part, and you do your part, and you don't understand, and I'll repeat it again, that what Jesus Christ did on the cross is all that you need. 100%, totally all that you need to stand in the presence of a holy God. We sometimes sing a hymn that contains these words. We sang it this morning, right? Jesus paid it all. He paid it all. All to Him I owe. Sin has left a crimson stain, but He washed it white as snow. And at the risk of being repetitious this morning, not only must you be persuaded that Jesus is all that you need to stand in the presence of a holy God because of what He's done, but I'll tell you, Jesus is all that you will ever need to stand in the presence of a holy God. He's done it all, folks. And that's what saving faith is all about when we come to that point, when we realize that. Now, do you understand why that first picture that I showed you where Michelangelo painted those faces with so much fear? It's because during that time, medieval theology, they taught that salvation was a cooperative effort between man and God. Where God does His part, you do your part, and both of you will work it out together. He gives us His mercy. We give Him our works. We give Him our obedience. And if that were the Gospel, folks, I'll tell you, Michelangelo should have painted all those faces with sheer terror is what he should have done. Because none of us can ever know that we have done enough to merit the righteousness of God. It'll never happen. Not a single person in the whole realm of human history has ever known that they've done enough to satisfy the righteousness of God. So, Hopefully now you understand why people who pray prayers sometimes are not saved. You know, we say to people, you know, you need Jesus, you need God. And they say, yeah, I know I need Jesus. And, and you say, we, you should accept Jesus as your Savior. And people will say, yeah, I know that. Sure, it can't hurt, you know, for me to have Jesus in my life. Or they think to themselves, I, I know I need God's help. And if accepting Jesus Christ as my Savior gives me God's help, I'm going to do it. I'm going to try it. If you are here today and you do not know Jesus Christ as your Savior, I'll tell you folks, you need something much more radical than God's help. You need God's forgiveness. That's what all of us need. And you need your self-confidence shattered this morning so that you come to God with nothing in your hands, but you come persuaded that Jesus Christ and His death on the cross is all that you will ever need to stand in the presence of a holy God. 
It's no wonder all these decisions that people make end up without roots and the leaves wither. And we say, we look around us and we say, well, where are the people who believe? Where are the, where are the children who accepted Christ in Christian homes? And we can't find them anywhere anymore. And we definitely can't find them serving God. It's because they have not experienced a saving faith. I was brought up in a Christian home. My, my dad is still, I mean, Christ, I had great Christian parents. My mom and dad were great Christian parents. My dad is still alive today. He'll probably watch this message and give me his critique later on. But he just celebrated his 88th birthday. My mom died years ago in 1993. When I was brought up as a little kid, I, brought up, I was brought up believing that you had to accept Jesus as your Savior. In those days, the terminology that we used was you had to ask Jesus into your heart. You know, it wasn't exactly scriptural, but it worked. You know, I mean, people have asked Jesus into their hearts and they've been converted. But as I look back on my life as a kid and as a young adult growing up in church, I know that, I, man, I was so deeply involved in things. We were always at the church. I was doing all kinds of stuff. I was involved in a lot of activities with the church. I, I've told you before, I wish I brought it with me, but on my shelf back in my office, I still have the first Bible that my parents gave me when I was a kid. And actually, I was a teenager. I was 15 years old. They gave it to me as a Christmas present. And in the front cover of that Bible, both my mom and my dad wrote some inscriptions in the front of that Bible. And let me read to you what they said. My mom wrote this. David, she always called me David, never Dave, I don't know. But David, always put Christ first in your life. Live every day of your life seeking his will and guidance. Love, mother. And then my dad wrote, Dave, my Christmas wish to you this year would be that throughout your life, may Jesus Christ be first. Only good things can follow if you keep this order. Dad. Now, I wish I'd listened to their advice, you know, because as you know, I, I walked away from the church for a good portion of my adult life. But, but here's the point. Even though I was brought up in the church, I had great, loving Christian parents. I was very involved in church activities. I read and studied my Bible. If you look through that Bible, you're going to see I underlined things and wrote notes and all kinds of stuff. And I think I even went forward at times during altar calls when I was a kid. But I don't remember ever truly giving my heart to Jesus. I just don't remember it. I don't ever remember this sense of God's presence in my life. And I'll tell you, I had no sense of assurance. No sense of assurance. I was saved kneeling at the side of my bed in the house that I still live in 20 years ago, just a few months after I started going to church here at Grace. It was at that point in my life, February of 2001, I don't know the day, I don't know the time, but it was at that point that I finally realized that Jesus had done it all. He'd done it all. It was at that point that everything became settled for me. And I am so glad that God saves people everywhere. But you know, after that time, when I finally said, I'm going to receive it in faith, no matter who I am, I'm going to believe it in faith, suddenly the doubts started to vanish. And I knew, and I was persuaded that Jesus Christ was all that I would ever need to stand before a holy God. And at that moment, the issue was settled for me. It was settled. You say, well, Dave, you know, don't you think that you were saved during those days when you answered those altar calls when you were growing up? And I'll tell you, I've thought about that a lot. And I have to tell you, in all honesty, I don't know. I don't really know. There's a part of me that says, well, yeah, I went forward because I felt the, the tug of the Holy Spirit. You know, Christ would have received me then and maybe that's true but I just lacked assurance and that's the point that I want to underline today whether I was saved earlier or not I don't know but one thing is sure all the time of my life up until February of 2001 I had no assurance assurance came when I said I believe that Christ is all I need period that's when I know that I was saved. So, what is saving faith? A couple of things that I want to mention. Saving faith, number one, is the persuasion of the heart. It's the persuasion of the heart. God has convinced you by His Spirit. You are persuaded. 
Paul says, I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. That is the root of assurance. When the Holy Spirit persuades you that Jesus is all you need, that's the root of your assurance. Now let's talk about the fruits of your assurance. It's the persuasion of the heart, but secondly, saving faith is also confirmed by the Holy Spirit. It's confirmed by the Holy Spirit. Look at what the Bible says in Romans chapter 8, verses 14 through 16. It says, For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. And Abba means daddy. It's dad. You know, many of you may never have had a father that you could call daddy, but that's the kind of relationship that you have with God when you're persuaded by the Holy Spirit that Jesus Christ is enough. Saving faith is confirmed by the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life. It says the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. So now there's the ministry of the Holy Spirit. We belong to God's family, and soon we have that sense of belongingness. It took me a while after I was saved. It was a process that I went through as I grew in Christ. But I remember eventually feeling and saying to myself, you know, I know God. I know Him. You know, I always wondered when people talked about having a personal relationship with Christ, and I was like, what, what's, what's that mean? You know, but as the Holy Spirit worked in my life, I finally got to the point where I could say, I know God. I have a relationship with God. The Bible says that the Spirit of God gives us that sense of belongingness. The Spirit of God begins to lead us. We're led by the Spirit, and we desire fellowship with God. Our affections are changed because of the Holy Spirit. That's the fruit of our assurance. I've known people who have sinned grievously after they were Christians. I've known people who have backslid and they've fallen into the depths of sin. But it's interesting that what you hear afterwards from them almost always is they will say, I am just so sorry that I did this because I really do love God. That's the fruit of the Holy Spirit working in their lives. And when I hear that, that's like music to my ears, despite their sins. The fact that they love God shows that the work of God within their hearts may indeed be genuine because the Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we belong to God. And we don't understand it any better than we perhaps understood it before. It's just a mystery. But suddenly the God who is so mysterious and so far away when we're not a Christian becomes present through His Spirit. And we say to ourselves, I know God. I have a relationship with God and I love Him. That's what happens. The Word of God produces within us the persuasion of the heart. The Bible says, Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, it says that if we confess Christ as Lord and believe in our hearts that God has raised Him from the dead, we shall be saved. For with the heart, man believes unto righteousness. Why? Because he is persuaded. He's persuaded. So the Word of God takes the Spirit of God. And then the third aspect of assurance occurs, and that's this. Saving faith creates within us the life of God. The life of God. Remember the text that we just read from 1 John says that there's life in His Son, and suddenly we discover growing within us the life of God. And then we begin to walk a life of serving God. And that results in being able to love people that we wouldn't necessarily be able to love before. It results in us being able to forgive people. And there's this whole life of growth now, and that was explained previously in a different message that I did. So I was asked this morning about somebody who has professed faith in Christ, but the part of their life, they've completely walked away. You know, and I can't tell you whether they're saved or not, but I can tell you that one of the fruits of assurance is a life of God. You have a life of God when you have the Holy Spirit of God living inside of you. 
you know. So it's one of the fruits that happens with assurance. So the root is faith that has been persuaded that Christ is sufficient. The fruit is the ministry of the Holy Spirit of God. He connects me with God. He lets me know that I belong. And the second aspect of that fruit now is the life of God begins to work itself out in me. And that finally starts those leaves to turn green. It's not brown anymore because I have a saving faith. Now, let me say a couple of words about assurance and then a few words about doubt and then I'm going to be done. So, first of all, Let's talk about assurance. Assurance is a process of growth. There are some people who come to know Christ as their Savior, and they they may waffle on the issue of assurance, and they're genuinely saved. But as time goes by, they begin to read the Word, and they begin to commune with God, and their assurance grows. That's why it says in the book of Hebrews that we should come before God. Now get this. Listen to what it says. We should come before God with full assurance of salvation or full assurance of faith. That implies that there's times when we come to God without full assurance. We come, but we don't come with full assurance. So there's another story about a man who uh, was living in a place where there was a lake that freezes over in the winter and he wanted to walk across the lake and it was an emergency. He needed to go get some help, but he was so fearful that he began to walk across that lake very slowly, trembling, as he went across it. And there were times when he wanted to get down on all fours so that he could spread his weight out because he thought the ice might be too thin. And while he was filled with fear and terror, suddenly he noticed that coming toward him in the distance was a team of horses running along that frozen lake. And when he saw that team of horses, he knew that he could walk across that lake with confidence. He had misjudged the thickness of the ice and everything was okay. I'll tell you folks, there are times when we come to Christ to believe on him. And just like the words of the hymn say, just as I am, though tossed about with many a conflict and many a doubt, fightings within and fear without, O Lamb of God, I come. I come. And so, We start out and we walk on the ice. We're not sure whether or not it's able to hold us. And then once we begin to walk, we develop the confidence. We see what Jesus Christ can do. And we get up and we walk with more assurance. I can tell you, folks, I am absolutely more confident in my salvation today than I was when I accepted Jesus as my Savior 20 years ago. There was growth in my assurance So let me say a few words about doubt. How do you handle your doubts? Do you remember a few messages ago when I talked about the children of Israel who had to put blood on their doors so that the angel of death would bypass them? And God said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And I mentioned at the time how important it was that when we face the issue of doubt, we don't look at the leavened bread We don't look at the bitter herbs. We need to look at the blood on the doorpost, right? There are a group of pastors out there today. It's pretty prevalent, actually, in today's society. There's a group of pastors who who are convinced that one of the things that we need to combat in the church is easy believism. I called it cheap grace a few Sundays ago. And so the way that they think that we should do that is by stressing that unless a person's life is radically changed by God, that they should recognize that they're not Christians. Unless you're pursuing holiness, unless you're walking in faith, etc., if you backslide too long, it shows that you were never saved, is what they'll tell you. And that's all well and good, because there is this emphasis on the life of God, like I just talked about. It's one of the fruits of assurance. But the problem is that people who listen to these pastors and this train of thought end up saying, you know, they hear them say, you know, when you doubt your salvation, you know, look at works and don't look at Christ. Look at what's going on in your life. You know, do you see the works? Do you see the fruit of your salvation? And it would be so easy to listen to these pastors who all say basically the same things and start to doubt your salvation. As a matter of fact, many of them would make you believe that unless your life is almost perfect, it shows that you were never saved. 
So let me ask you another question this morning. A question that each of you should have to answer and should be able to answer for yourself. If I were to ask you, if you were to die today, and God were to say to you, why should I let you into heaven? What would you say? What would you say? What are you trusting for your salvation? And I'd ask you to just think about that for a second. How would you answer that question from Christ? What are you truly trusting for your salvation this morning? And if you can say to me with all honesty, Dave, I'm trusting the blood of Christ and nothing else. Well, I want you to understand something. If you are trusting the blood of Christ, that's enough. That's enough. And if you were to ask me, can you assure me of that? I would say with 100% confidence, yes, that is enough. You can be assured of your salvation if you're trusting on the blood of Christ alone. And so I'll tell you, when I get done here in a few minutes, I'm going to leave here today. I'm going to head home. I'm going to do basically the same things I do every Sunday, watch a little television. I'm going to watch my Colts today because the NFL is starting today. I'm going to go home and do that. Maybe do a few minor things around the house, come back to church later. I'm supposed to meet Ivy at 4 o'clock to work on some financial stuff here at the church and work a little bit, get some food. But I'll tell you, if on the way home today I were to get into a car accident or I were to have a heart attack or any number of other unforeseen things that would kill me, if this is the last message that I ever preach from this pulpit, and by the way, I have no premonition of that, but if this is the last message that I ever preach, will you please always remember that Pastor Dave's last words were, the blood of Christ is enough. The blood of Christ is enough. There's a hymn titled, My Faith Has Found a Resting Place, and it says this. It says, I have no other argument. I have no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. And if I should see God, folks, before any of you do, and he should say, Dave, why should I let you into heaven? I'm not going to stand there and say, well, Lord, I preached, I taught, I prayed, I read my Bible, I studied, I was a good person, I did all these things. No, I'm going to stand there and I'm going to say, Father, I believe your word and I believe that the blood of Christ is is enough. It's enough. Are you folks, are you persuaded today that the blood of Christ is all that you will ever need to stand in the presence of a holy God? Are you persuaded that the blood of Christ is enough? You say, Pastor Dave, I believe. Well, I'll tell you, believe where you're seated. Believe where you're seated at home watching and say, yes, I believe. I accept him because I believe that what he did is absolutely 100% enough. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father, this morning I think of those who, just like that song we just uh, mentioned, being tossed about and all of the doubts and, and things that they have. I just ask, Lord, that the Holy Spirit would speak to those people who are here today who do not know where in the world they stand in their relationship with you. Lord, I pray that you will bring them to the point of salvation at this moment and just have them cry out to you and say, I believe that the blood of Jesus is enough. Lord, just give them that gift as we pray. And and I'll just tell you this morning, all of you with your head still bowed and your eyes still closed this morning, you just need to talk to God right now. Talk to him right now and just right where you're seated. He sees your heart. He knows what's going on in your life and just simply say to him, Lord Jesus, I believe that you're enough. I believe in you. Just tell him that right now. Lord, I just ask that you do the work that only you can do this morning. Plant that tree deeply. Help those leaves to turn green, Lord, and sink the roots into deep soil and help us to not ever be uprooted. We thank you, Lord, for your saving grace. In Jesus' name. Amen.